last month, Attorney General Jeff Sessions responded to churches that ha had concerns about the policy of separating children from their parents. He used a particular line from Paul's letter to the church in Rome to legitimize this policy. Every person should place themselves under the authority of the government. There isn't any authority unless it comes from God, and the authorities that are there have been put in place by God. So anyone who opposes the authority is, is standing against what God has established. People who take this kind of stand will get punished. I could give you an entire sermon about why using Paul's words there would make the Apostle Paul kind of roll over in his grave. Not all law is okay, and that is what the Apostle, and the Apostle Paul knew that. Jesus was found guilty of committing a crime against Rome. That was the law. He claimed to be a king. A king, and claiming to be a king as opposed to the emperor was a crime, and he was put to death for it rightly under Roman law. Peter never would have said that Jesus' execution was a moral act. Not all law is okay. Now, the response to the attorney general from churches across the nation was predictable. The eternal general's use of the Bible was taken out of context, and so national church leaders responded, including our United Church of Christ leaders, responded with a whole slew of scriptures, um, a lot of from the prophet Isaiah and elsewhere, uh, advocating for the compassionate care to be extended to any immigrant. We in this sermon series, we are looking back to the then, the experiences of our ancestors in faith, to help us have a perspective on the issues of now. And here's the truth. When it comes to national immigration, the movement of people from one nation to another, refugees, the biblical record is mixed. And yes, I can give you that whole slew of scriptures supporting the rights and the care of immigrants. I can do that. But I want to be honest with you. The history of back then is mixed. Israel, in the days that the Bible was being written, Israel today has an uneasy relationship with its neighbors. In general, though, the way that Israel has looked at itself the identity of the people and the nation of Israel was confessed in these particular lines from the Torah. You should solemnly state before the Lord your God. My father was a starving Armenian. He went down to Egypt, living as an immigrant there with a few family members. But that is where he became a great nation, mighty and numerous. The Egyptians treated us terribly, oppressing us and forcing hard labor on us. So we cried out for help to the Lord, our ancestors, God. The Lord heard our call. God saw our misery, our trouble, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, with awesome power and with signs and wonders. God brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land full of milk and honey. Israel identified itself as a nation of immigrants in a way that isn't too dissimilar to the way that these United States see themselves. People came who fled oppression to a new land, a land of milk and honey, a land of opportunity. Now, as the centuries passed, Israel also came to know famine. 
And the time came when there was a refugee crisis. During the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A man with his wife and two sons went from Bethlehem of Judah to dwell in the territory of Moab. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They entered the territory of Moab and settled there. Naomi and Elimelech were, became refugees in the neighboring country of Moab. Now, Moab and Israel didn't exactly have a cozy relationship. There were multitudes of wars and conflicts between these two nations over the years. And yet, in times of crisis, refugees from both nations, from Moab into Israel and Israel into Moab, refugees would immigrate. Naomi's story in the book of Ruth is a story of refugees coming from one nation into another and how King David, the great king of Israel, came as the grandchild of a marriage between a Moabite woman, Ruth, and an Israelite, Boaz. And that, their great, their, and that one of their great, great grandchildren himself was a child born in Nazareth named Jesus. King David and the Davidic line of kings claims its heritage to a mixed marriage between a Moabite woman and an Israelite. It is not a crime to ask for refuge. It's not a crime to ask for safety in another nation, then or now. The story of Israel is replete with refugee stories, from Abraham, the wandering Arab man, to the immigration of the, the Israelites out of Egypt, fleeing political persecution, so much so that you wonder how anyone could make a biblical argument against compassionate and inclusive welcome to refugees who were fleeing persecution, leaving behind the land that they knew for the hope of life and new life and opportunity. And yet, in the long history of Israel, Israel went through dark days, days of fear. Early on, when they were refugees fleeing from Egypt, they looked across the Jordan River into the land that they were hopefully going to inherit. And they felt fear. There were nations there already. And there was a fear that echoed in these words. Now once the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to take possession of, and he drives out numerous nations before you, the Hittites, the Girishites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations that are larger and stronger than you. Once the Lord your God lays them before you, you must strike them down, placing them under the ban. Don't make any covenants with them and don't be merciful to them. Don't intermarry with them. Don't give your daughter to one of their sons to marry and don't take one of their daughters to marry your son, because they will turn your child away from following me so that they end up serving other gods. So how does that happen? How do you get it from a place where you put them under the ban, no intermarriage, no relationship at all, to then later celebrating the, great, the, the, the marriage of Ruth and Boaz and their grandchild, King David. It was fear. It came down. Those passages 
forbidding the intermarriage, forbidding relationships, it came down to fear. Because when we're afraid, fear can justify some horrible action. Native Americans in our time, in our, in our story, were wiped out, hunted, brutalized. The Shawnee Mission that is just north of here, that was after a forced march of Native Americans, it was set up, for lack of a better term, as a concentration camp. It was set up as a place where families were forced to march with their children across and not be able to leave that camp, internment camp. They, were, they lost the battle out at Tippecanoe. And that became, we live in the shadow of their destiny. That act was done in fear. A fear of the Native Americans that lived here a fear that was recorded even in the founding words of our Declaration of Independence. The king has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. That fear... That fear justified acts of hate and violence. After being crushed by the Babylonian Empire, the nation of Israel was restored a century later by Persia. Now, Israel at this point became a vassal state. It was no longer the independent kingdom it once had been, but it lived tenuously under the freedom granted by the emperor of Persia. The people who returned from exile and resettlement in internment camps in Babylon, they lived with an ever-present fear because they did not want that to happen again. They were no longer the great nation that they had been in the past, the nation of David and Solomon. Their line of kings was broken, and the future was uncertain. And so in the midst of their fear and their uncertainty of the future, an Israelite, a governor named Nehemiah, he had an idea. Build a wall. Restore Israel by building a wall to keep people out. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the scriptures reflect the national response in their time to the fear, the tenuous fear that they were feeling by building walls and dissolving families. The book of Ezra records the breaking up of families in response to Nehemiah's leadership. A man named Shechaniah believed that the national ethnic purity was essential for Israel to return to its glory days. We've been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the neighboring peoples. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Let's now make a covenant with our God to send away all these wives and their children according to the advice of my master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God. The sacred bonds of family, of marriage, of parent and child were jettisoned in response to a time of uncertainty and fear. Then, and now, what lessons can we learn for the living now from the experience of our spiritual ancestors? Here's the truth. When Israel acted out of a place of fear, it never achieved its goals. After those brutal wars of conquest fought against those seven tribes, which you did an admirable job pronounce, 
Israel was never able to rest peacefully because the violence begat more violence. And to this very day, there are those who believe that if only Israel had wiped out with genocide their neighbors, would they truly have ever known security and peace? And then later, in the years of Nehemiah and the years that followed, the nation of Israel never, never saw a return to its former glory. Fear of neighbors, visions of ethnic purity, they are part of our story, dark parts of our story. A new king eventually did come to Israel. An inclusive king who welcomed all people of all nations, Jew and Greek, slave and free. A king who proclaimed a way of honoring God by honoring neighbor. A king who had been once been himself a refugee living in Egypt. This is my king. This is the one who shows to me the heart of God. God is love, and those who remain in love remain in God, and God remains in them. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. This is the way of the one that I would call king. The one who calls me to work in my life, to drive out the fear that I feel. Casting it out the one who calls me to a higher love. The other way, those cycles of violence, they don't work. It leads to those cycles of hate and violence that cannot and they never have brought peace. The Bible is made up of stories of people, individuals and of nations. And God. It's a story of good times and bad, of glory and despair, of fear and of hope. What I've witnessed in these stories is that the greatest moments of glory are found when we choose, we as a people, we choose to love and to care for all people. The God that I proclaim is synonymous with love. God is love. And there are no, there are certain sacred bonds, certain bonds of love that go beyond law or policy. There are bonds of love that cannot be sacrificed to fear and uncertainty. I take that message from the cross itself. On the ground that I stand with the one that I would call the king of kings, the king of all nations. And so in the name of Jesus, will you pray? My king, you taught that we must love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our being, and with all our mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And that we must love our neighbor as we love ourselves. All law depends on these two commandments. You call your church to compassionate love and care for all who are oppressed or who are in need. You remind us that there are bonds that are sacred. What God has joined together, let no one separate. And as your body alive today, let us hear a word in your name. Amen.